Bienvenidos a Los Secretos del Éxito con Gaby Wall Street. Hoy les tengo un episodio muy especial. La gran entrevista que le hice al candidato a la presidencia de Estados Unidos, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Así es, esta entrevista fue presencial en nuestra conferencia anual de Latino Wall Street Awards en Miami. Les tengo que contar un dato curioso acerca de esta entrevista. Su equipo quedó demasiado feliz con el contenido de la entrevista, con las preguntas que le hice, con sus respuestas. Estaban muy, muy felices todos detrás de cámara cuando terminamos. Estábamos compartiendo eh, cuando la entrevista terminó. Y lo que más me sorprendió de esta entrevista y lo que le hace histórica es que la jefa de su campaña publicó la entrevista completa en su página diciendo que es de las mejores entrevistas que le han hecho a Kennedy en su vida, de las mejores que ha visto. A mí me llamó muchísimo la atención leer eso, porque obviamente es una persona que tiene 70 años y ha estado toda su vida en el ojo público y le han hecho miles de entrevistas. De hecho, después de la entrevista que yo le hice, estuvo eh, con Dr. Phil, después estuvo con Pierce Morgan, eh, básicamente en eh, Fox News, o sea, como que las plataformas más gigantes y mainstream eh, en inglés, ¿no? Que se puedan imaginar, entonces, de entrevistas y de, de calidad eh, y de contenido, eh, tiene demasiado. Así que creo que eso dice mucho lo que ellos pensaron acerca de esta entrevista. Así que comencemos. so much everyone and Mr. Kennedy, I want to start by acknowledging you for whatever it took for you to get here. I know it wasn't easy and the fact that you're here sends such a powerful message to our Latino community that you're a stand for us, about your commitment to us and that you care about us otherwise you wouldn't be here. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me and thank you everybody for being here. So we're going to start with a fun fact. Muchas personas no saben que habla perfecto español y quiero que la primera parte va a ser en español y que nos cuentes acerca de tu experiencia viviendo en Colombia. Atrás de cámaras conversamos que también viviste en Perú. Cuéntanos cómo esas experiencias te han conectado con la comunidad latina acerca de nuestra situación financiera. Sí. Uh... Cuando yo estaba joven, cuando yo tuve 14 años, cada verano después trabajé en una finca en Los Llanos, en Colombia, cerca de la ciudad de Vivesencia y adentro del río Meta. Y estaba una finca de a diez mil hectáreas con uh, un ganadería con, con vacas y, y cuidando vacas y caballos y, y todas la, las cosas del campo. Y entonces, en, uh, en 1973, uh, viví en Perú, en el altiplano, en una pueblo pequeño se llama Ilave, con los indios amaras. Y, y también en, uh, en el año 2001, yo estaba para el, la, la, el verano en una cárcel, prison? cárcel. Mm -hmm. en Puerto Rico. Porque Maximum Security, un, una cárcel se llama Guaynabo, porque yo uh, uh, estaba uh, trabajando para, uh, para uh, arreglar el, la, la armada de los Estados Unidos, estaba Bombadero Viecas. Y, y, la, yo estaba uh, uh, trabajando en, en forcing the Navy to leave Viecas. I brought the law. Yo estaba abogado para, para los grupos de Puerto Rico 
he, El Hus put me in jail for the summer. So in, 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 um, in esas tiempos, pude practicar mi español. <laughs> wow, qué interesante lugar donde practicar español. Pero he olvidado mucho y tengo que practicarlo otra vez. Uh, pero en uh -huh. cárcel no. <laughs> Excelente. Entonces, we're going to switch to English. Mr. Kennedy, you have emphasized the importance of education throughout your campaign. And I would like to know, how do you see financial literacy fitting into that traditional educational model? I'll tell you just an example from my own life. My father was Attorney General of the United States. He was the campaign manager for his brother. My father was Robert Kennedy. He was the Attorney General for his brother, John Kennedy, when my uncle was president. My uncle was killed in 1963. And in 1964, my father ran for Senate in New York. And he, became, he was elected senator. And then two years later in 19, and, and as most of you know, in 1968, he then ran for president and he was assassinated during that run. I was with him when he died in Los Angeles. Uh, two years earlier, he had walked through a neighborhood, the poorest neighborhood in New York City, it was called Bedford-Stuyvesant. And he had walked through that neighborhood and he made a decision to devote a large part of the energy for the rest of his life to figuring out ways to bring financial literacy and capital into that neighborhood. It was, the neighborhood was very, very poor, but there was a very strong spirit and an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, but there were two things that were what people lacked. One was there was no access to capital. This is because even by then, there was only about 30 uh, minority-owned banks in our country. And, the bank, and, so, and they, they were underfunded and undercapitalized. The Fed would not give them money. And so the availability of home improvement loans, of, um, of, of home loans, so you could go borrow money and, and buy a home, it wasn't available in those communities. So many of the people were living in absentee houses. And if you don't own a home, you have no access to capital. If you own a home, you can borrow money. But in these communities, they couldn't get mortgages. And the communities were redlined by the bank. So they wouldn't make loans in them. And if you don't have access to capital, you're going to see high crime in those communities. And that's what happened. Well, my father went to the communities and, and said, we're going to figure out how to make the banks loan money and to, and to get capital flows back into this community. And, but you also know one of the things they said to him is, the people said to him is, you know, we have a strong entrepreneurial spirit, but we don't really know how to run a business. We don't know how to do, you know, inventories and accounting and, and taxes and all of the things that you need to know if you're going to run a business. So my father got some of the leaders of the Wall Street to commit one day a week or one day a month to come to Bedford-Stuyvesant and, and meet with aspiring business people. He got... Tom Watson, who was the CEO of IBM at that time. He got Andre Mayer, who was the CEO of Lissard Frères, and many, many other business, and they agreed to, to, to donate their time to come and coach business people. Now, when my father died, I took his place on the board of Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration. And the first time I went there was in 1966 with my dad. And all of the stores were boarded up. There was no commerce. The nearest grocery store was 75 blocks. And today, if you go to bed it is booming. There's commerce that is flowing out onto the streets. There's a grocery store, a Pathmark grocery store in the neighborhood. And there's lots of opportunities and lots of role models of black and Hispanic businessmen who are doing very well and who have roots in that community and who are 
financing the little leagues uh, who are buying hockey uniforms and football uniforms for the kids, who are giving uh, jobs to people, to children when they work in the summer, and all the things that happen when you have business within your community. And they now are able to pass that financial literacy and that business, that accrued business knowledge. My father recognized he was never in business, but his father was in business, and he went to Harvard, so he knew many people who were in business, and if he wanted to start a business, it would be a simple thing. He'd pick up the phone and ask questions of his friends. But if you lived in that community, you didn't have access to that kind of knowledge. And my father, one of the important things that my father did in restoring that community, and what we did, what I worked on for 40 years, is to make sure there was financial literacy in that community. And the outcome of that has been extraordinary. The, the you know, business is booming today in bed -Stuy, and it's become the anchor, the financial anchor for all of Brooklyn. I, I love that. That's so powerful and so true. And that's part of what we do here in our mission to educate and empower the Latino community so that they learn and they get into business and finance. So let's switch to inflation. Inflation has affected many Americans tremendously, especially in the last few years. Um, if you were elected president today, what is your plan to address that? Yeah, I mean, inflation is a, is a product of printing money um, and then and, and inflation is actually a tax on the poor. It's a way of devaluating your bank account, devaluating your salary, devaluating your, sec your fixed income and that money is shifted upward to the super rich and we saw during COVID when President Trump and President Biden locked down our country for 500 days, they not only bankrupted the middle class in this country, they closed 41% of black owned businesses will never reopen. They closed 3.3 million businesses. They left open the big businesses. They left open Walmart, they left open Amazon, but the small businesses that enrich our community that are the basis of the American experiment, experience, American democracy were all locked down. 41% of black owned businesses will never reopen. And many of these had three generations of equity in them. And, but not only did it hurt the middle class, but it enriched the super rich. So there was a shift in wealth, the largest in American history of $4 trillion during that 500 day lockdown, President Trump and President Biden, upward to a new oligarchy of billionaires we created, in 500 days, we created 500 new billionaires, a billionaire every day. And the money came directly from the American middle class. And in order to sustain that, we had to print money because nobody was working, nobody was paying taxes. And all of these new costs were imposed on the government. So President Trump, during his short four years, President Trump, when he came into office, promised that he was gonna run America like a business. He said he was gonna balance the budget. Instead, he, re he ran up the biggest debt in the history of our country. He spent $8 trillion in four years. It's more, he spent more money in those four years than every president combined from George Washington to George W. Bush. 283 years of history. President Biden, in his three and a half years, is rushing to catch up with him. President Biden is adding to the debt $1 trillion every 90 days. Our national debt is now $34 trillion. We spend more just servicing that debt, paying the interest on that debt, than our entire military budget. Within five years, every dollar that we collect in taxes is going to go to serve. 50 cents out of every dollar we spend in taxes is going to go to servicing the debt. In 10 years, 100% of every dollar that we collect in taxes will go to the debt. It's not sustainable. And the way that we're paying for that is through inflation, which is just a way of taxing the poor. 
the, one of the largest causes is war. Um, war, is, uh, war requires us to print money. And in fact, fiat currency, which is paper currency, was invented precisely to finance wars. If we didn't have paper currency, if we just had gold or silver, we wouldn't have wars because nobody would put up with, the politicians would have to come to us first and say, I'm gonna do a war in Iraq against Saddam Hussein, who never did anything bad to the United States. And we're gonna spend $4 trillion on that war and you're not gonna be able to spend your, send your kids to school and you're not gonna be able to pay for your retirement. Do you wanna do this? And we'd all say, no, we don't wanna do it. And, but they don't have to do that. They can just make the war without even getting Congress to approve. And then afterward, they print the money and we've spent $8 trillion on these forever wars over the past 20 years. Every one of them, the country we had the war in, is worse off than we found it. We have fewer friends today. We have, around the world, Americans are less safe. The middle class is hollowed out. We're experiencing now, we're paying for those wars with inflation. And the only way we put an end to this to inflation ultimately over the long term is if we end the war machine. We have to wind down the war machine. That's what I'm gonna do as president. We have 800 bases around the world. China has one. Russia has one and a half. All of those bases are in countries where we're, that are waiting to start a new war to, to continue this pipeline which helps the military industrial complex. It helps the big bankers. It helps, you know, the pharmaceutical industry and the and some uh, financial interests. Uh, they're all disastrous for the American people. So we need to get our hands on the cost. We need to reduce the cost of government. We need to start doing that by cutting the military budget in half. Um, and we can protect our country with, with half that. That's what Eisenhower's budget was during the height of the Cold War. And we need to also wind down the chronic disease epidemic because that's the biggest cost. That's costing us $4.3 trillion a year. And that's five times the military budget. And we have the highest healthcare costs of any country in the world. Businesses are paying $2,000 a month per person for healthcare. It's bankrupting small businesses in this country. And we have the sickest population in the world. Nobody has a chronic disease like we do when I was a boy. 6% of Americans had chronic disease. Today, 60% do. And uh, today, for example, diabetes, which affects uh, Hispanic communities more than any other, Hispanic and American Indians. I, um, when I was a kid, a typical pediatrician would see one case of diabetes in his entire career. 50-year career, one case. Today, a typical pediatrician, two out, one out of every three kids who walks through his office to door is pre-diabetic or diabetic. And it's costing us, diabetes alone, the, the mitochondrial dysfunction is costing more than our military budget. No other country in the world has anything like this. We, we have more chronic disease here and it is bankrupting our country, destroying our morale, it's hurting particularly people in poor communities, communities of color, Latino Americans. And, um, and, uh, and we're, I'm gonna fix that. I know how to fix it. I'm happy to talk about exactly what I'm gonna do to fix it, and I'm gonna fix it quickly. We need to drop these expenditures. It's the only way, ultimately, that we can get our hands on the problem of inflation. <laughs> Very powerful. I think we've all realized how crucial it is to reduce spending that is taking us nowhere good. So we would love to know what legacy do you hope to leave behind? How do you want to be remembered? I know you supported cryptocurrencies, support investment, education. How exactly would you like to be remembered? Would I like to be remembered? Yes, what legacy we you like. You mean to a political legacy? Yeah, in general. I think we've seen not only, we've seen the deterioration of a loss of hope in our country. In, in 2013, um, 
there was a poll taken of Americans, I think it was Gallup, of young Americans under 35 years old. And they were asked, are you proud of the United States of America? And 85% said yes. The same poll taken five months ago, only 18% said yes. So somehow in the administrations of the last two presidents, an entire generation of Americans has lost their pride in our country and they've lost their faith in their own futures. We have a generation of kids who, is not going to get into, who are not going to get into homes, who will never buy a home. The central promise of the American dream when I was a kid was that if you worked hard, if you played by the rules, that you could buy a home, you could finance a home, you could take a summer vacation, you could raise your family, and you could put something aside for retirement on one job. There's nobody in this upcoming generation who believes that that promise applies to them. I have seven children. One of them is 39 and he has a house. The younger six siblings, they all went to the best schools in our country. They have, uh, they have great jobs, they have great friendships, and none of them believes that they're gonna be able to afford a home. When I was their age, I was looking to buy a home already but none of them believes that they are gonna be able to get in the home. The price of housing in this country has doubled over the past year. It's gone from about 200,000 to over 400,000. And the, the interest rates have gone up, have also doubled. And that means that home is costing you four or five times what, what it was a, a year and a half ago. And there are many reasons for that, but one of the main reasons is you have these giant companies, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, Fidelity, that those three companies own 88% of the S&P 500. So they own our economy, and now they're trying to buy all of our land and all of our single-family homes. Last year, almost 30% of new homes purchases were uh, were investment houses, and individuals can't buy them anymore. And probably a lot of you have had the experience of knowing somebody who's about to buy a home, and at the last minute, uh, a, a, somebody else comes in with a cash offer 20% over the asking price and snatches it off the market. And if you ask, who was this person who just took my home? It turns out to be an LLC with an ambiguous name. And if you pull the strings and follow who is this really, it, turn, it leads you to BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, Fidelity, these big companies that are now owning us. And we're turning from an ownership society into a rental society. And when we do that, we go from being citizens to being subjects. Home ownership is so important. It's important because if you own a home, you care about your community. You care about your police, your firefighters, your teachers. You, you go to the, the PTA meetings. You go to, uh, you, you, you care about your neighbors. You care about the appearance of your home. And it roots us in communities, but more importantly, you have access to capital because if you own a home, you can take a second mortgage, and then if you do have an entrepreneurial impulse, you can borrow that money, you can bet your home on it, and you can build a yoga studio, or a sporting goods store, or a, or a bar, or a, um, a bowling alley, or whatever it is, and, and, or a restaurant. And you know this is traditionally what Hispanic Americans have done. They start a small bodega or a little restaurant and it's the gateway and they build themselves a future. Well, if you don't own capital, you don't own equity, you will not have access to capital. And that's what's happening to our country now where the capital and equity is being stripped from the American middle class and sent upward. And it's being stripped by a series of mechanisms that are deliberate and systematic that are pumping wealth upward to create a new oligarchy. And you know, I visited every nation in Latin America during my lifetime. And when I was young, you know, all of these countries were tremendously unstable. Why were they politically unstable? Because they had terrible economic 
the stratification. They had poor people at the bottom, and then they had and they had you know widespread poverty at the bottom, and they had a, a rich, wealthy oligarchs above. And U.S. foreign policy was to look at the poor people as potentially communists and put all the money into keeping these military juntas and, and dictators in place and keeping the oligarchy at the top. And there's a, there's a wonderful Peruvian economist whose name is Hernando de Soto. And he said, he looked at, you know, he, you look at this configuration of stratified, stratified configuration, if you have rich people above and a lot of poor people below, it can't support democracy very long. On countries like Bolivia, where it was really extreme, you'd have 100 coup d'etats in, in 120 years. And it can't support democracy because the, the job of one political party is to protect the prerogatives and the privilege of the rich. And then, and they have to, nobody's gonna vote to make the rich richer. So in order to get the vote, they have to lie to people, they have to fix elections, they have to deceive, they have to intimidate people, and you start getting a very violent society. And people below feel like they're being robbed, which they are, and so it gets more and more violent. And Hernando de Soto said the cure for that and the reason for that in Latin America is because it's very, very hard to get land title in Latin America. There's laws that make the title um, very uncertain. And most countries, you can own land, but you cannot get title that you can go borrow money on. And what he said is the solution to poverty in Latin America is to make it easier for people to get title to their land. So, um, I, you know, I believe that I believe both foreign policy and our domestic policy should be rooted in trying to get people land ownership and trying to build the middle class. When my my uncle went in 1962, he went to Colombia, and he was there with Yeres Carmargo, and Colombia had just come out of a, a, a time called La Violencia. 200,000 Colombians had died in violence of the kind that I, for exactly the reason I talked about. It was a rich class and a poor class and they were at war with each other. 200,000 people died and Yeres Carmargo came in. My uncle traveled my, a lot of times when he was, President Kennedy traveled many, many times abroad when he was president. But he said that his, the statesman, and he had met the smartest people in the world, he'd met uh, Charles de Gaulle in France, he met Eamon de Valera, who was the George Washington of Ireland, who he loved. But of all the state leaders that they met, the one they admired most, him and his wife, Jackie Kennedy, was Yeres Carmargo in Colombia. They thought he was the smartest, um, uh, the most visionary leader that they had met. And there were two million people in the central plaza in Bogota who, who came to greet my uncle. And Yeres Carmargo said, do you know why they love you? And my uncle said, why? And he said, because they think you put America on the side of the poor. My uncle made a resolution when he came into president. He was asked by his best friend, Ben Bradley, what do you want on your gravestone? And he told Ben Bradley, he kept the peace. He said the primary job of a president of the United States is to keep the country out of war. He said he didn't want children in Latin America and Africa when they heard United States of America to think of a man with a gun. He wanted them to think of a Peace Corps volunteer. He wanted them to think of the Alliance for Progress, of USAID, which he created those programs to rebuild the middle class. And today, and he kept our country out of war. He kept it out of Laos. He kept it out of, he never sent a combat troop to Vietnam. He kept it out of Germany. He kept it out of Cuba. And today, there are more statues to John Kennedy in Africa, Asia, and Latin America than any other president. More boulevards named after him, more neighborhoods, universities, colleges than any other president, probably more than all the US presidents combined because 
People wanted America to be on the side of the war, but be on the side of the poor and to be on the side of peace. And I want to restore that moral authority to our country. I want to restore that real leadership to our country, the effective leadership, the respect that people had one time for our country around the world. And in this country, we need to start by restoring the middle class, and that means getting every American into a home. Absolutely, we need a strong middle class because one of the major issues in Latin America is that there's really no middle class. You're either doing really well or you are very poor. And I think the wonderful thing and the main reason why we come to America as immigrants is because there's a strong middle class and we all have a shot to have a decent life. So Mr. Kennedy, I want to thank you so much for coming here for your valuable time. And I just wanted to say that it's very inspiring to see such an influential leader like you come here, play full out, do whatever it takes to support our community with your message. It really speaks volumes and we're very much grateful. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bueno, espero les haya encantado esta entrevista. Yo me la disfruté demasiado. Me reí, me inspiré y aprendí demasiadas cosas que antes no sabía. Ahora quiero contarles algo más. No solo su equipo quedó encantado con toda la experiencia, sino el mismo Kennedy quedó tan feliz que lo compartió por todas sus redes. Lo que fue su experiencia en Latino Wall Street, escribió que fue un privilegio estar en Latino Wall Street, compartió nuestras fotos y todo. Tanto así que hay parte 2. Así es. Vamos a estar juntos nuevamente, esta vez de forma virtual. Voy a estar liderando lo que es el Latino Town Hall, traído a ustedes por Latino Wall Street, donde voy a estar en vivo y en directo con él a través de Instagram Live este domingo 7 de julio a las 8 de la noche, hora este. No es casualidad que este live sea un domingo en la noche que estamos concluyendo el fin de semana largo del 4 de julio, que es el feriado nacional por el Día de la Independencia de Estados Unidos, porque vamos a hablar acerca de temas que son muy importantes para los latinos viviendo en Estados Unidos, que es un país que representa para nosotros los latinos oportunidad y vamos a estar profundizando en temas acerca de, de economía, de migración, de educación, sus propuestas acerca de esos temas y muchos más. Les tengo por ahí también unas sorpresitas durante este live. Así que espero que nos acompañen en el primer Latino Town Hall traído a ustedes por Latino Wall Street, 7 de julio, 8 de la noche, en vivo y en directo. Nos veremos nuevamente con Robert Kennedy Jr. por ahí. Hasta la próxima. Si te gustó este episodio, no olvides en compartirlo, en suscribirte y seguirme en todas mis redes sociales para mantenerte al tanto y aprender sobre la bolsa de valores, inversiones, finanzas y muchos más secretos del éxito. Nos vemos en un siguiente episodio.